Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our final round of ACC 2020 virtual house call interviews uh, that me and my team are conducting. I'm, I'm Kevin Kunzman, Managing Editor of HCP Live. I'm joined today by Dr. Sanjeev Gulati, MD, FACC, uh, Chief of Cardiology at the Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute. And Dr. Gulati is going to be joining us to discuss and break down some of these uh, final findings that we uh, disseminated and, and reported on in our ACC coverage on our site this week, um, both pertaining to some fairly well-known trials with some fairly well-known drugs, uh, DAPA-HF and Paragon-HF. So first and foremost, we're going to break down some um, subgroup analysis that was uh, taking place in DAPA HF, but first and foremost, Dr. Gladi, do you want to just take a moment to introduce yourself? Well, Kevin, th yeah, thank you very much for um, allowing me to speak with you today. Um, as you had mentioned, I'm the uh, Chief of Cardiology at the Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute, which is part of Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm actually also the uh, Medical Director for the Heart Fair and Transplant Service, so kind of a dual role, uh, and been in the, in the heart fair um, field for uh, well over 20 years, so really uh, both these trials today that we talk about are kind of in our wheelhouse of what we're looking at and how we can take care of heart failure patients better. So again, thank you for the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can't agree with you more. These are, um, seems like certainly pertinent and very relevant uh, data discussion points that we now have from DAPA HF and Paragon HF. And something that an expert said to me actually, even before the meeting began was the emphasis of uh, now that we have these SGLT2 inhibitors that are uh, making rounds and, and sort of to some extent uh, competing with one another to you know advance in, in terms of capability and, and known efficacy. He, he highlighted um, their potential role in heart failure and our understanding of how it benefits patients. So um, Depagliflozin, uh, these new findings show that uh, they significantly reduce time to first and recurrent hospitalizations for heart failure related events in, in patients. Do you want to break down what really stood out to you in terms of these findings and what the impact yeah, is? Yeah, so I think, you know, to your point with DAPHF, we know that the primary endpoint was cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, and urgent um, heart failure visits. And to your point, um, in the treatment arm, um, there was a significant reduction in the primary endpoint, 16.3% uh, versus placebo, which was 21.2%, and really showed similar benefit from terms of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. So overall, kind of the primary endpoint was very positive for um, depagliflozin um, in terms of treatment. Uh, now, when you break the trial down, you had about 2,300 patients um, in both arms, so the treatment arm and the placebo arm. Um, about 18-month follow-up. Uh, the average age was about 66. A quarter of them were female, so majority male, and about 42%, if I recall correctly, was uh, was were diabetic. So over half were not. So symptomatic, low ejection fraction, and just as just remind everybody, we mean less than 40% typically. Elevated pro BMP um, were all kind of the main criteria and to leading to that primary endpoint. So we know overall the trial was was positive across the board. Now, when we start to break it down, I think there's a couple of things that were very interesting from that standpoint. So number one, when you looked at the diabetics versus the non-diabetics, there was a very similar reduction um, in terms of positive effects of the of the drug compared to the placebo. So almost a 25% relative reduction for diabetics and non-diabetics. And that's again gets to the whole concept of what you brought up. This is not just a therapy for diabetes. This is really a, ter a therapy now what we're going to consider for heart failure patients. And the subcontext to that is really now a heart failure specialist, general cardiologist, whoever takes care of heart failure, and definitely the primary care doctors who manage diabetes, we have to start thinking of these patients in a very different way. You know, like everything else in life, you get so subspecialized that you silo your care. And so as a cardiologist or heart failure doctor, I always tell them, get your diabetes taken care of but I'm not the one jumping in to manage that. I defer that to their endocrinologist, their primary care doctor. And now as a cardiologist, really gonna make that effort to say, we really need to be treating you. But now it clearly also has effects in a positive way for patients who are non-diabetic. So we're gonna have to really rethink of how we use these drugs in the heart failure clinic or cardiology clinic for even the non-diabetics. So really important thing there. Other important kind of subcontext or sub uh, endpoints, or, or sorry, secondary endpoints, is the quality of life. And we saw an improvement in quality of life in the treatment arm. And so again, the reason I bring that up is we talk about symptoms, we talk about quality of life, and more and more, again, in heart failure world, we recognize that quality of life is as important, if not more important, to the patient 
uh, compared to like mortality and hospitalizations. Those are hard endpoints that cardiologists are used to for years taking care of and, and looking at when we look at data. But really, when we talk about a patient with a chronic deadly disease that really limits their every day, when we look at quality of life is as important for those patients, if not more important, depending on that age group. So I think that's really important um, that there's a benefit um, in terms of quality of life. And that was using the uh, Kansas City uh, uh, cardiomyopathy questionnaire and showed a significant improvement in that question. That's a very standard questionnaire that we use. Um, and then when you looked at across the baseline of medications, really there was a benefit across um, the treatment arm compared to uh, with all the medications that were used. So again, really kind of independent of the baseline medications, again, uh, benefit for, uh, for DAPA in terms of uh, treatment and outcomes. Uh, what was also kind of interesting in this trial was that there was a relatively low use of uh, Secubitrol, Valsartan, or Entrusto is the branded name, and I know we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but uh, again, that was not used as heavily um, as more other contemporary trials are starting to use um, uh, uh, the Secubitrol, Valsartan combination. So really kind of in summary from um, this trial, uh, overall improvement in heart endpoints of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization improvements in uh, quality of life, and then really a similar uh, improvement in the diabetic and the non-diabetic patient um, as we look across this. Yeah, it, it certainly seems to hit all those notes of um, assuring uh, patient quality of life, like you said, um, lessening the burden of, of treatment and care overall and reducing events, and that's really what you're looking for, generally speaking, in these heart failure trials. Uh, speaking from a clinical perspective in, in uh, the conducting of the trial, I thought it was particularly interesting how the investigators emphasized the need for understanding encompassing uh, event risk instead of time to first event, um, as, as they pointed out in, in layman's terms, essentially, this is a slippery slope. Uh, most patients are at an extreme risk of hospitalization, and once that happens, the risk is greater and greater and greater. And you see that in the patient population of, of those who maybe were on placebo or just previously had um, recurrent events over and over again. Can you speak about uh, assessing uh, these therapies as we continue to assess them more and more greatly for heart failure and emphasize their utility there? Um, to consider the role of first and recurrent events. And I think that's really um, an important concept that uh, is becoming more to light. And, you know, a lot of this has been driven, um, to be very honest with you, like through the kind of quality improvements that hospitals have been under scrutiny for, you know, readmissions, length of stay, mortality that are becoming more public reported. But that's actually fallen in line with what we in cardiology have looked at and realized that there are two things. One, we want to prevent, you know, it gets back to what level of prevention you're talking about. So really true primary prevention is try to control your diabetes, control your high blood pressure, your cholesterol, so, and then exercise, don't smoke, don't use vaping products. All those things are kind of really true primary prevention to reduce the risk of ever developing heart failure, say, for example. And as we look at these medications, we're really in that kind of either secondary or I would almost call tertiary prevention. So secondary prevention would be you have heart failure. How do we prevent a high risk event from occurring? So i.e. how do we end up preventing you from ending up in the hospital or dying from your heart failure? And that's that kind of pr that first event or that we're talking about. Because once you get into that and you've got into the hospital, for example, you know, we know that repeated hospitalizations actually predict mortality in heart failure patients. So that gets to that, your, your kind of recurrent events that we're talking about. So once we've identified you as even a higher risk patient, how do we prevent that from cascading even worse um, down the road? And that's why these trials are actually been becoming more and more important is not only time to first hospitalization, as we've seen with this trial as other trials, but then also the repeated. Do they get do we prevent the recurrent hospitalization or readmission? And again, what we do know across the board is by starting medications earlier in the course of heart failure, it's critically important to reduce the rapid progression to recurrent events. So really we are trying to, um, in the heart failure community, remind people that even with newer drugs like this, that the key is to identify heart failure patients early, educate them, start them on medications, maximize their doses, and that really leads to kind of what you're asking is how do we reduce that first event and then recurrent events?